Welcome back, everybody, to the Self Storage Income Podcast. We're so excited to dive into today's episode. This podcast is being brought to you guys by Live Oak Bank, Tenant Inc., and Janus International. Welcome, everybody, to Self Storage Income. And we have a special episode we have not done before, but we have a lot of questions that everybody has been asking, everything from our YouTube channel and directly to us. So today we wanted to directly answer your questions and we've gone through and we found a lot that are uh, the same or that follow a theme. And so we're just pulling them right off and we're gonna answer them directly to everybody that asked um, on YouTube and also on Instagram. And they're great. We have a lot of really, really good questions. So we have Yen in here with us today that's gonna help us out and uh, read questions here for us. Welcome, man. Glad yeah, this is you. like it's a special exciting. treat. Yeah, right. a special Q and A episode going on here. <laughs> exactly, yeah, it's awesome to have you, dude. It's gonna be fun. Glad to be on. Thanks yeah. for having me. Let's dive into this because I really want to get. We we have a wide range of questions. Um, we are not going to even remotely get close to all of them. So we've kind of ranked these as the ones that we go. Okay, these are the ones that the most people are asking or have hit on. And so let's dive into it that way. So what do we got? All right, so this was a question from our self-storage bubble video um, from late last year, or actually earlier last year, and it was about interest rates because the Fed's been jacking up interest rates all across the board, you know, um, and we're scheduled to have even more rate rises most likely in the coming weeks. Um, so we've got a question here uh, saying, if rates, meaning interest rates, rise a lot more and force people to leave their houses, wouldn't that be positive for self-storage, especially if people are downsizing? Yeah, so this is a great question. And I think, you know, when it comes to uh, especially the data, the thread in the video, the self-storage bubble, um, which, you know, we're, we're now seeing, uh, of course. Uh, funny enough, we just went uh, today. Um, I think, yeah, I think today we went under contract on a deal that, uh, three months ago, they were asking uh, almost $9 million for it. I think we're under contract at 6.6. We've got, we're seeing this across the board. Um, just before we walked into the podcast, um, you know, Kaylee, who we had on our head of investor relations, uh, walked over and said, hey, we've got someone that has a distressed storage facility. They're, they don't know what to do now. They're, they're in trouble. Um, you know, can we look at this thing? And we, you know, I'm like, yeah, of course we can. And the driving factor in this is that uh, the rise in interest rates have a few effects. The effect that a lot of people are seeing when you're out in the market of self-storage is the value or the price that the market is placing, okay? So that external price we talk about a lot. Um, hence the, you know, eight plus million to 6.5 million. And that has to do with the cost of that money. Now, the next side that um, uh, we have on interest rates that you're seeing is when people were locked in at a low interest rate and now their interest rate is changing mm -hmm. and they didn't build, they did not buy with anticipation of their rate going from three to seven. And now the money doesn't, it, it doesn't cash flow. It takes up all their money. They, were, they bought it too expensive or too thin. Well, there's a third leg to this. And this is where this question's really addressing. Now, in the Great Recession, people lost their homes. That created movement within the self-storage industry because self-storage benefits from movement. Now, interest rates rising has done the opposite. Because we would think, well, interest rates rise, that means people can't afford their homes. But over 93% of all in-place mortgages in the United States are under 4.5% interest rates on a 30-year mortgage. Now, when you go up to like 6% interest rates, it's like no one, right? It's like 99% of all mortgages are below 5.5% interest rates. They're not anywhere close to today. And they're on 36 uh, on they're on 30 year mortgages. Now, while interest rates have gone up, incomes 
have also gone up. Unemployment has not gone down. So, or unemployment has not gone up. So people still have their jobs. They're getting raises and they're locked in at mortgages that were 3% that worked great at that income. As long as they don't need to refinance, right? As long as they don't need to move, they're fine. So it has the reverse effect as opposed to having movement, it stagnates because now people that want to buy home or want to move are choosing not to because it's unaffordable now because it went from three to 7%. So now everyone that has mortgages are like, we're not doing anything. We're just keeping this and we're going to keep it because we can't afford a new one. And then all the people that wanted to move or buy homes, they can't. So now they're just staying place or they're just renting. So the opposite of 08, we now have a stagnation effect. That's not good for storage because we make our money on movement. You have seen this directly coincide with occupancies through the fall. The housing market shut down in the fourth quarter, yeah. right? Occupancies followed suit almost in tandem and we had the biggest drop in occupancy that we've seen in years. No, that's a really, really good answer. Um, do you think Do you think there's a lot of people out there selling their second homes and things like that? You know, that's a really good question. We find that in those markets where you have second homes primarily dominated, those always get hit worse, right? Because people, when they need to sell their homes, right, then all of a sudden there's nowhere to buy. I don't think we've really seen that pick up yet, but I think we will. So we're not at that part of the downturn. We, we still haven't gotten to unemployment. We still haven't gotten to that point. But when you do, second homes, first things to go. And that creates a very downward spiral on those markets and those homes because when interest rates are 7 8%, ain't nobody buying a second home. You know what I mean? It's like, I'm not going to buy a second home at 7.5% interest. It's hard to invest. Exactly. So then the people that are selling it, they don't have anyone, any buyers, so they have to just drop prices. So that's where I actually see big housing prices drop are in those areas, but only if we have unemployment. So once, you know, the interest rates get, which we were supposed to, I, I look at it like this. The Fed is trying to force unemployment. Right. So they will get to a point that they're going to make dramatic measures if we don't get it. So unemployment should rise. Then we should see it. Housing overall, though, we have not seen a major drop. Now, some people are like, well, we saw a 19% drop in the housing prices. Not year over year, though. Even in markets that have been hit really hard, like Boise, Idaho. Oh, they're still expensive. They're still expensive. We're still 3% above what it was the year prior. So it's 19% off the high, but that was a spike, right? So generally speaking, we're seeing stagnation, not movement. Yeah, that's such a good thing to remember in these times like this where we're, and we've kind of touched on this a little bit just in the storage industry specifically, um, but just how we're, how we're returning back to even just a normal. Yes. And it's not that like yeah. things are going down or any no. of these things. It's just going back to a normal and what that actually looks like. And that was the whole point of the self-storage bubble, right? The video yeah, and the threat. Yeah. We are in a bubble. We have occupancies that are averaging 96% across the United States. Mm -hmm. We'd never seen anything close. The, close. the next closest high, historical high, was 86%. We are now re returning to that norm. And that norm is coming off this bubble. So the bubble's popping and we're returning back to a baseline. But when you buy at the top of a bubble, even the norm now hurts. Mm -hmm. And that's where we see the pain. Yeah, that makes sense. That was a great answer, AJ. I think that uh, that housing, like you said, has a lot to do with self-storage and what you can even get for units, right? Um, which that in turn affects your property value. Yep. So if people aren't moving and your property value goes down, then people are gonna be put in that crunch. Um, well, while we're on the topic of things slowing down, we have another question here uh, asking, um, asking us to actually make a video about this. Uh, can you make a video regarding the recent slowdown, whether that be industry moving back to seasonal changes or something bigger? I guess the question here is, is there something bigger at hand going on or is this just a symptom of the winter, a slow season? you know, seasonal changes within the industry. Yeah, I think it's this time it's more than seasonal, but it's what Connor said. 
it, it's more than seasonal because we haven't had seasonal swings like we used to have it all in the last three years. So it, we used to have big seasonal swings, summer to winter, occupancy would really rise and then really come down. Well, that ended, it was just like high occupancy. So now we're returning to seasonal swings, but we're also returning to a lower occupancy mm -hmm. high. That feels like a double whammy, right? So you're coming from where no seasonal swings and occupancies at 95%, to occupancies back down to 86% with a seasonal swing, that is a very exaggerated first seasonal swing. We're seeing it within our portfolio. Our portfolio, we've seen an exaggerated seasonal swing that is twice what was normal. And that has led to much lower, uh, uh, lower occupancies. Now, you guys might wanna, uh, we, we did a podcast and I think a video on why occupancy doesn't matter. I think you remember, you might want to go back and see that because it was funny because I was talking to somebody and I'm like, yeah, one of our facilities at 75% occupied. And they were like, what? Right. I'm like, well, it's 25% up on revenue. So it's okay. Right. It's, you know, it's like, <laughs> right. that's what we do. So not um, too worried. <laughs> exactly. Not too worried. So when we look at that, we, we, we look at the, the fact that the seasonal swings are much, much larger. But in general, with that said, we're not seeing that the revenues are cratering, although rates are 100% coming down. Mm -hmm. So next year, we will see this adjustment. It will go back to those seasonal swings. And I think what he's asking, is it more? It's more from the bubble point, yes. Like we won't probably see 94, 96% occupancies anymore. It'll be down in the high 80s. And so that is more, but it is a more return to what was a normal, if that makes mm -hmm. sense. I don't know. Yeah, that no, makes it, sense? it totally does. And I'm glad you hit on the, uh, the rate aspect as well and the rates coming down, because that was another thing that I wanted to make sure we mentioned too, where, you know, that's, and it's a balance, right? Because you have that, the occupancy and the revenue and yeah occupancy doesn't matter to a certain degree you yes. know once you get down it's like okay well now we got to drop rates or hey occupancy gets really high now we got to raise rates like there's a there's a, there's a really good balance in there yes. we've had a lot of really good internal discussions on this and stuff too just lately and at what point do you really need to focus on those things and so i'm glad you mentioned the uh, the rates coming down and those things but again like aj saying that that return to normal where you know people are freaking out about you know a high 70 um, occupancy or, you know, occupancy just returning to, you know, 80s. Um, but again, like you said, it's a double whammy when you get that occupancy in addition to rates coming down and revenue that coming down. It's true. like, whoa. And, and too, I think exactly, you know, what Connor's talking about here would hit the head on uh, the nail on the head. But you also have to remember the storage is very localized. Okay. Right. So we, we, what we see right now is exaggerated in certain markets. If you were in a market that was overbuilt and had was very largely depend, dependent on new home sales and incoming migrations, you are gonna feel this exaggerated from a place that wasn't nearly as predicated on growth, hadn't been overbuilt, and doesn't have new uh, inventory coming on board. If you had new inventory coming on board in the fall, the housing price, the housing market slowed down. So you had no new people moving in, right? You're gonna, this is gonna be exaggerated. And this year, right now, it's gonna be harder on you. And you, you, we got new facilities that are coming on board right now. And they're coming on board in a lot of the markets that were overdone. Well, they're gonna struggle to fill up because now the competitors aren't at 96% anymore. They have vacancy, they're trying to fill up. So what do they do? They drop prices. Now, if you're in a market though, that had no new inventory coming up, you might not really see anything, right? You may not even notice. So it is very, uh, very market driven and specific, uh, but on average, right across the board, you're not even in markets that were not affected, air quotations, it's not going to be like it was the last two years. They're not going to be able to get rates up because that core demand has softened. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, and I think for the listeners that 
may not know exactly what we're talking about. We actually made a couple of videos on this. So the self storage bubble video on our YouTube and why occupancy doesn't matter. We'll link those in the show notes down in the description, wherever you're watching us and uh, you should check them out. It's got like data and charts and everything backing ex basically exactly what you just said. Exactly. So big changes are coming for sure in the self storage yeah. industry. Um, this, so this is, this is an interesting one to, to follow up with. It's more on the development side of things, so Ooh. I think, uh, Connor, you might be able to speak to this one. <laughs> um, so this was a comment on our video, how much money do you need to get started in self-storage? Um, and she's saying, I'm looking to build a storage unit. Do you know how I would structure that? Do you usually buy the land first or, and then finance the construction? Or do, like, what does that process look like when you're first building a facility? Yeah, generally, that's a great way to go about it, you know, going and securing the property and um, then going and securing your construction loan to do that. Um, and obviously, it, in anything structure, this is one of the things that I always was kind of confused about just in real estate and in business in general was was the structure of deals. And there's no one way to structure a deal ever. There's like some different industry standard concepts that people follow. But when it comes to structuring that deal um, and that construction project, uh, I mean, you can go you, you can go and get lending, you can go and get investors, you can seller finance and creative finance. Um, but yeah, when it comes to the, to the construction loan, again, you can com you can uh, combine that with investors. You can you know maintain the 70-30 situation, whatever that looks like. Get the construction loan, get it built or just do the construction loan all the way through. Um, a lot of different ways you can do that, but generally, yeah, you'd wanna secure the site and then secure that construction loan. You have anything else you'd add to that? No, I think the, you know, the only add-on that I would uh, put on to that would be depending on the permits, depending on the um, zoning, would really depend on whether you wanted to buy the land or not. It, so if it is ready to go, it is uh, approved for storage, everything, then buying that land and then going and building it, that makes perfect sense. Now, if you're buying land, though, that isn't approved for storage, it would probably be, be better to buy the land with a contract that states we will purchase it upon acceptance of being um, qualified. So uh, upon approval, excuse me, of storage, then we will buy it. That way you don't buy land to build storage, um, especially if you're paying for the land as if it was made to build storage, and then going through the process and not being qualified. Um, now, that is a much more risky way to go. It is much more profitable, and we have done this. We've just been uh, been through this. Actively it's doing actively that doing now. it, um, <laughs> and it is way more profitable because you're buying something that isn't available or approved, and you're turning it into it. So, for example, on our property that we did, we bought it at five bucks a square foot, right? Land that is approved for that type of use in the city today, not even on a good location like ours, is you know fifteen plus bucks a square foot. So you're immediately tripling your equity, right? Um, but that we do that because we understand it. We know the process. We have a whole team to go about it. It's way more risk. So you should really be careful if you're buying the land with that intention and it's not approved uh, for it to recognize that next step. If it already is and you're like, I'm gonna buy here, it's approved for storage, buying the land, getting the loan, working on great way to go about it right yeah dude so glad you added that for sure it's a huge huge piece of the puzzle it's just how much risk you want to take on yeah yeah so kind of as a follow-up question to that we had somebody ask about um because this is buying a piece of land you know building it from scratch and how that what that looks like what would you say is the difference between doing that and buying an existing facility what are some of the differences or advantages or pros and cons that you would say i know cash flow is kind of a good yeah good yeah. Thing to have. yeah cash flow is nice <laughs> yeah um so there's two different sides to it uh, 
the first thing that most people just go straight to is risk. Right. I, I got to be careful with how I say this. Yes, but not always. Let me give you an example of our facility that we're doing down in Surprise. So um, we are doing a development. We're in the final stages of raising and getting our final numbers for it. And people may say that's really risky to go build you know, a storage facility right now. But if you look at it, and I think about this as a comparable, let's say that market in general, if I had to go buy a storage facility, well, I would pay three times the amount for it. And especially at the time, you're paying at the highest rates, you're paying at the highest occupancy, and you're paying at the lowest cap rate. So for us to go buy the land and get ready to build, right, we actually, it was, to me, way less risk because the market was incredible. It was a great market, all that kind of stuff. But if we were to buy in that market, we would have had way more downside than we would have had upside. Mm -hmm. The acquisition cost vastly out, out was, was greater than the uh, you know, replacement cost. For exactly. Sure. And the other component to it is when we build, we can exactly cater that facility to the market. Mm -hmm. So we're going to have a facility like nobody. Now, if I acquire a facility, we get what we get. And it's a new asset. And it's brand new. Exactly. We get to pick the location. We get to pick the product to service the customers. So we're, we're, we're exactly tailoring it to it. That so means we can targeted. maximize. Very much yeah. more targeted. Sure. So we can maximize that asset in a way that we could. We can add things in to give it a competitive advantage that others don't. So in general, when I got started, we would not develop. Here's why. It was way, it, to say it was more risk isn't even close. It was so much more risk because I didn't know anything about building. I knew nothing about developing. I didn't even know anything about storage. So for me to go then and develop a storage facility <laughs> is crazy. That, like that risk was so yeah. big. So we bought and it, that asset paid us to learn, right? Yeah. And we got wealth and income while we got an education. So that is, I think, generally speaking, why we say one is way more risky than the other, right? At a certain level, at certain market cycles and things, I think it is actually a lot more market centric. Now, there is no arguing though, that on a cash flow basis, there's more risk. Obviously, it's not full and you have unknown revenue marks, right? So yes, it is more risky on that basis every time, unless you buy a bad deal. Hmm. So along those lines, are there like any advantages that buying a facility would have other than cash flow over a development? Is it just less risky or? You have data that you can actually review. Oh, uh, okay. Uh, I mean, because you have existing tenants, existing market, existing facility. You've got the data um, where, again, I mean, building a new facility, you got the lease up, you have, I mean, there's a lot of unknowns right. in development, Okay. even though it might be a no-brainer, even though replacement costs might be uh, a lot less than acquisition cost. Yeah. But like AJ hit on it, really just, it really comes down to your competency and what you can actually execute on and what you know. Um, because yeah, if you don't, if you don't know storage, you're going to be like one of these guys that we bought in from that went and built, you know, a thousand five by fives and is like, that looks great on a pro form and a spreadsheet, yeah. but in reality, it doesn't, doesn't work, work out well. So yeah, I think hey, you, you hit it on the head. I think that your ability to see the reality of the situation. Like you can look at an acquisition and we can underwrite it and see, is there demand, is there not? Can I push rates, can I not? And, and you can also then take that and overlay that to the market. So way more, less risk, but you also get things a lot of people don't think about, higher depreciation. So if I'm buying an older asset that's existing, I get depreciation year one and I get more of it. A newer asset, you get less depreciation because there's less to depreciate, it's brand new. And you also, there's other advantages. You may get into locations that are not available. So if I buy a existing facility in a certain location, there may not even be land to develop in that area. So there's a huge advantage of that, right? I get to enter into a market uh, marketplace at a point 
that is not obtainable through development. And I think that when you look at the financial side, with the development, it may be three years till I break ground. Whereas with an acquisition, I may have all my money and profit out in three years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. And very different. Yeah. <laughs> so, right. well, talking financing, that's another huge benefit of having yes. an existing asset. Financing and lending is a lot oh, easier a lot to secure. Easier. It's a, probably, I, honestly, Kaylee might know better, but I would say, even with you know those more development uh, focused investors, it's it's a lot easier to get investors um, to to invest when they actually have numbers and yeah. things to look at. Um, so, ra if you're raising capital, it's it's probably a little bit easier. Um, that, that was another benefit that I thought of as you were, you were talking oh, that's financing. Good, that's an excellent one. You're, you're right. If I have to go raise capital, so perfect example, we're, we're finishing our raise for the Arizona, but then we also have our fund one that we're raising for, right? Fund two. Or fund two, that's yeah, right, excuse yeah. me, fund two that we're raising for. So when you have an asset that you can explain to an investor, right, as opposed to potential, um, they like that. now. Funny enough, though, when you're talking about like total returns, I mean, the development has way, way more upside. I mean, you're talking about something that we're going to put out of the ground at 120 bucks a square foot and assets in that market trade for like 200 plus. All of a sudden you're going, you, you, your ability to create ec equity wealth off of a development pales in comparison uh, to a acquisition right but when you've got to go get capital you're talking about something that doesn't exist to an investor and if you don't have experience in it that can be really hard to convince an investor that your idea and your financials and what you're saying is going to happen is actually going to happen if you've never done it whereas if you're showing an investor this is what exists the investor can take that they can look at it and they can see and they can say you are correct right that's a big difference so this is kind of a really broad question, but it kind of has to do with what we just talked about. Um, there's a guy saying that he's starting a full service facility and on a boat and RV facility, actually. Um, but he has no idea how to find investors. So he's asking, how do I find an investor? What's a full service RV? So a full service RV, there's a few different models. But generally, I think when people are saying full service RV, we have a, it's been an is it like the valet entity. style? It, like they can do valet, washing, dumps. Like, gotcha. yeah, they do everything. Okay. Like, like, you just come pick up your thing and roll. Cool. Like, yeah. <laughs> okay. The, yeah, there's gotcha. some that, like, they have a, an, an actual, like, car wash in it, right? Oh. And then they'll go get it to you. They'll, they'll, they'll get it all the water done. They'll fill it up. They, they'll take care of it, and then they just deliver it to For you. For a small fee. That's right. <laughs> so uh, but when you're looking at especially something like valet, that is way more closer to a business. Meaning your investors are gonna be more of like the business, people that are looking to invest in a business. Um, this is what I tell people when you need to get investors. Here's exactly what, what you need to do. First of all, you need to make sure that you obviously are doing this all legally correctly. So anything that I tell you doesn't matter unless your attorney talks to you about it. Nothing, okay, I'm not an attorney. I don't know what I'm talking about, right? I'm just an idiot with a podcast. Talk to an <laughs> attorney. Disclaimer. <laughs> like, yeah, don't, <laughs> please do not get this confused. Um, but you should be doing a few things. Your direct contacts, right? Then you need to be doing individual outreach, which you should go to Facebook forums in that local market where you're going to buy that asset or do that business. And you want to find all the forums that are doctors, all those types of people that have money that want to invest. And then you can meet people, you can propose your idea in that local market because those people know that area. You should also go find groups in that that have to do with all of these high paid professions. Okay, the next thing you want to do is you want to, so you have your online, which you need to go and, and do your online. You have your local R, uh, RE meetups. Like, so you, you have real estate meetups, in cities all over the country, there are investors that are actively looking to put money to work in those in those meetups. So that's I I would focus on a two tier strategy, right, or a three tier, excuse me. Your personal contacts go online, go to where the money is, 
and then on the ground, right? And outreach, meaning take people out, directly go. This isn't like an email thing, right? So you need to be prepared. You need to be you need to be very professional. You need to have attorneys look over this. You need to be able to explain all the ins and outs, the dangers, the risks. You need to understand the setup. You, you got to have all of this down. And then you need to be able to explain the pros and cons, exactly what they're investing in, what they're getting in, and then go to where that the money is, both online and in person. And hit the road. Like, mm, go right. out there, knock doors. This yeah. is sales, right? Yeah. This is, it kind of makes me think of that, um, how like a lot of people will say, and who knows, the, the individual that left this comment, they might be out there crushing it and doing all these things. <laughs> but it reminds me of the, like, I can't find any deals kind of thing, where it's like, well, how much are you actually doing? Like, are right. you actually going out and you, you, are, you are you getting picking the up the phone? Yeah. Are you actually talking to people? Are you going to the meetups? Are you actually doing the thing? 100%. It's, I mean, Listen, I, I invest asking people for money can be awkward. Oh, yeah. You know, it's it really funny because I've never gone to family or friends. Mm. Ever. I never did. Oh. I went very far out. I didn't even go to my local area. That's funny because family and friends are the first people you think of. Yes. You know. But it was awkward for me. Yeah. So, like, you know, funny enough, like, outside, it, it, well, okay, first of all, it's me, my dad, and my brother-in-law. They are family. But for us going outside to them, never. We've never asked anyone. We've never, never would. It's it, it's all more strangers, and um, that is. It, this is hard, everybody, and this takes a lot of work. Okay, it, I was lucky because I was in sales, and I was in corporate sales, right? So I was used to knocking on doors. That's what I did. I go around to businesses and ask to talk to the CEO. Right, that's what I did all day long. I just hit the streets and go knocking on doors, and so I was, I think, really familiar with it, and I was okay with that. Um, but I remember the first time that I had to go knock doors, and so to ask people for money and strangers, nonetheless, um, it, it can be hard. So you need to get really good about understanding how to build a relationship and making an organic, natural ask. So. Perfect example is structuring conversations in a way that it comes up. Oh, so what do you do? That's awesome. How long have you been doing that? That's great and everything. Then, well, what do you do? Well, I invest in self-storage. Like I've got this deal that I'm doing right now. It's awesome. Wait, we get depreciation year one. We get this great cash flow. I'm going to have all my money back out of it and everything in a year and a half. I'm like, oh, geez, that's amazing. Like, yeah, I know. I've just got to wrap up the final things. I'm looking for money and investors, and uh, we're going to get this going. So if you know anybody that'd like to invest, let me know. Yeah. I didn't ask him. Mm -hmm. Right. I Dude, didn't ask him. That's one of my favorite things <laughs> is literally anytime I'm like, I kind of like, whether it, anything, any kind of ask, and I'm like, that's the guy. That's the exact route where it's like, hey, do you know of anybody yeah. that's interested in this thing? Like, because it makes the ask so much easier, at least for me. You open it's up so the much door, more natural, and like, then they go, yeah. and two, then they turn it into an ask. Yeah. Well, well, I could invest. Yeah, I invest. Right. Oh, well, so I can only take accredited investors, things like that. So I, I'm not sure, but may, you might meet my qualifications. You know, why don't, why don't I do that? I'll get your email and I'll shoot you over my qualification. They're now asking you, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. So and you got the contact. And you got the contact, yeah. and then, but they're coming after you to get it. So, I think that you, the best way to make those sales and everything is to set it up naturally, not just go out and say, I've got an investment for you. Like mm -hmm. if you send an email to somebody, that nobody's scammy. scammy, nobody's gonna do it, right? Get to the next step, make it natural and organic. And two, don't predicate the relationship, the conversation or anything else like that on a yes or a no. People feel like they're getting used. Mm -hmm. That's not what, I, yeah. I can feel it right off the bat. You don't want that. The other thing that makes me think, you know, it's like a mindset shift too, where you use the term asking people for money a couple of times. And yes, that's what you're doing. But one thing you need to really think about too and understand is the fact that there's more money out there than there are deals and mm. people looking to place money than there are deals. And you are an opportunity yes. for those individuals to help grow their wealth, to help impact their lives to help progress their lives all these things that we do with impact freedom progress 
that's what we're doing. We're allowing individuals to come in and participate in this machine of, of capitalism, which is one of the greatest machines that's you know ever been introduced um, to societies and economies. And um, yeah, I, like I don't doing ask people for money. Yeah. I share an opportunity if they want to hear it. 100%. But I don't go to them. Are you willing to invest 150000 No, never. Act now. I'm, I'm not going <laughs> to ask, money. you know, right? It's like, we've got this yeah. great opportunity. If you, like, you trust us, I'm happy to share the opportunity with you. But you're exactly right, Connor. You're sharing an opportunity. Hence the reason why it needs to be organic. It needs to be real. You're not going and asking for this act. Uh, this ask that makes things awkward, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. I have an opportunity. That's why you start out talking about what you're doing. And then you're like, yeah, if you know anybody that would like an opportunity like that or want to invest, you know, let me know. And now you've set it up so it's an opportunity that they want to come in. That's a perfect way, Connor, just, yeah, that's exactly right. I think that's a great way of putting it, aging. Yes. I think that's uh, it's gonna help a lot of people think about it in their minds in a different way. Cause it's definitely daunting to just walk up to somebody, hey, 100%. give me money. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's. I don't want to do that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And by the way, our minimum investment's a hundred k. Yeah, <laughs> so. exactly. Well, but, I wish we had more time to answer more questions because we have so yeah, many of these this has things. Been great. That's I know this awesome is great. We're going to do this more. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I, I want to make sure. Let us know what you think. Leave yes. a review. Send us some more questions on, you know, Instagram and YouTube. Uh, Self storage income at AJ Osborne. Come yes. Check us out. We'll do it too. We'll probably do a YouTube video with it as well. So we can get to them because the questions are amazing and uh, we like getting back to exactly what you guys want to hear from us. So thank you guys for doing it. Appreciate it. And we'll see you next time. Thanks so much, guys. Thanks, everybody.